What's a greedier plot? Try and steal money from a place with the most surveillance that anyone could encounter? Or would it be running a fake daycare with phantom kids to steal millions of taxpayer money from the government? These are just a couple stories of the greediest people in the world. Number four, cheating friends. Hugh Duke Lam and Z Yi Lu scammed a major Sydney casino called The Star out of over $500,000. Lam, a now former employee of the casino, was alleged to have conspired with Lu over three games of Baccarat. The two communicated before and during the games, conspiring to have Lu walk away with mountains of winnings that the two would later split. The scam was extremely simple at its core. Being the dealer, Lam communicated with Lu throughout the games to ensure he knew exactly the right moves to make and when to make them. Their secretive teamwork went unnoticed by the people around them, allowing the pair to make off with about $570,000 in cash and $170,000 in chips. The pair probably thought they got away with it, as it was easy to sneak their winnings off casino grounds. They were wrong. Nobody is that lucky when games are played as they should be, and when it does happen, alarm bells go off. With these two, close examination by casino authorities brought the whole scheme to light, and the police were brought in. The pair were arrested in September 2020, with the cops catching Lou at a casino parking lot and Lamb at home in Canley Heights. Authorities showed no hesitation in issuing search warrants, and when police executed those warrants, they hit the jackpot. A house in Canley Heights yielded around $270,000 in cash, another $2,000 in U.S. dollars, along with multiple electronic storage devices thought to hold pertinent evidence Wheaten the deal. Meanwhile, Lou's home and ride hosted $300,000 in cash and almost $170,000 in casino chips. Fleecing a casino requires an extreme degree of either intelligence or stupidity. Detective Inspector John Cosgrove pointed out that casinos are full of cameras and that every move is always under scrutiny. A spokesperson for the Star confirmed that notion, saying it didn't take staff long to figure out something was up and alert authorities. Number three, Knives Out. Kaylee Pepper of Hull, UK, allegedly pocketed around 20,000 pounds from a tragic charity she set up with the best intentions. Pepper set up the Rich Foundation after her brother caught a blade to the spine in 2015. The charity existed to help those left behind by victims of tragedy such as gun and knife violence and to advocate for legal means to reduce such tragedies. Richard Pepper met a violent end right outside his Hull home. The perpetrator, Daniel Flatley, was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to 11 years behind bars. The crime left Kaylee in ruin. She expressed that she wanted to keep her brother's memory alive. This sentiment eventually led her to establishing the Rich Foundation, which helped victims' families. The foundation collected funds for final expenses and advocated public awareness about dangerous weapons and violent crime issues. While her intentions in 2015 may have been pure, by 2018, it wasn't hard to see that temptation was getting the better of her. Pepper came into contact with Jenny Dees, who had lost her son to an accident with a modified air gun earlier that year. The Rich Foundation stepped in to help raise funds for little Stanley's funeral, but some of the money went missing. 2019, 2,850 pounds raised by three women intending to donate to local schools went missing after they handed it over to the Rich Foundation. Pepper gave them several excuses and even forged an email from GoFundMe. Eventually, Pepper was found to have pocketed somewhere around 20,000 pounds throughout the years. The prosecution, however, maintains that the actual amount stolen is closer to 33,000 pounds. Around 1,240 pounds made its way into her personal bank account on one occasion. Another time, she spent over 300 pounds on holidays and gambling. In one sinister photo, she was even caught at a ladies' night function for Stanley Metcalf with her hand and in the cash box. Dee's fury ultimately led to the scammer's downfall. Of everybody that had a reason to throw Pepper to the wolves, Dee's had the strongest. The woman became suspicious when the big raft let ladies night raised a mere 88 pounds. Dee's friends told a different tale, collectively claiming to have thrown down far more cash. That suspicion led Dee's to investigate on her own, which eventually helped the police bring Pepper down. The woman had lost her young son, and Pepper's theft essentially made a mockery of both the boy's legacy and his mother's pain. When most people think of air guns, they think of airsoft sports played with minimal armor and plastic toys that can barely pierce a soda can. The reality, however, is that modern air guns at the high end can compete shot for shot with their black powder brethren. The 
catch, however, is that regulations are looser on air guns in many cases, and they're easier to illegally modify. That's basically what Albert Grannon did. While the UK requires a firearms license for air and black powder weapons, air guns with low enough power are largely unregulated. Grannon's gun was bought as a low-powered unit, essentially a toy, but modified to pack a punch. The circumstances are unclear, but somehow six-year-old Stanley took one of those overpowered shots to his abdomen while visiting his great-grandfather Grannon. The man's story was that he checked if the gun was loaded and shot it into the ground. It then ricocheted and hit Stanley. Forensic results apparently confirmed that was not the case. The boy was found injured in the home and later succumbed to his injuries in the hospital. Grannon was characterized as showing no emotion or remorse throughout the case. For what was, at best, grievous negligence, Grannon was sentenced to three years in jail. Pepper's actions injected more hurt into the senseless tragedy and the fragmented family it left behind. Her theft directly affected memory efforts. Some of the cash she stole was meant for a memory garden for Stanley. Thanks to Pepper's selfishness, that garden was never built. Instead, she allegedly spent it on clothes, utilities, carryout, and more, living well above her meager means. Hull Crown Court had no mercy for Pepper. The scammer had gone the last three years of running her charity without keeping accurate records. This breach of law kept the court from accurately calculating how much money had gone missing. Judge John Thackeray described the defendant harshly and asserted that the only way to deal with her was to lock her up. In March of 2022, he handed down her sentence. Serving under her new name, Kaylee Tow the fraudster is enduring 20 months in prison. Number two, the eyedropper. Jesse Krzyzewski of Franklin, Wisconsin stumbled upon a horrifying sight. He found a friend she'd been caring for sitting dead in the living room. Krzyzewski made the call to authorities on October 3rd, 2018, a bit before 5 p.m. Upon arrival, there wasn't much that authority crews could do. They found the resident of the address unresponsive, surrounded by crushed up pills and prescription bottles. It wasn't hard to assume what had happened. Krzyzewski told police she had observed disturbing behavior in her friend, identified by courts as Lynn Hernan, leading up to her passing. The victim didn't have much contact with anybody besides Krzyzewski, and she was thus the only one who noticed when the victim's medicine intake began to fluctuate. Krzyzewski gave police a tiny amount of information when the investigation first began. While this appeared to be a cut and dried case on the surface, they still had to follow protocol. Procedures drifted away from Krzyzewski in two new directions, other people the victim knew and Hernan's autopsy. Krzyzewski, it should be noted, claimed to be Hernan's power of attorney. She also claimed to be checking in on her twice a day. Combined with previous revelations, this makes for a rather odd situation if it's all true. Investigators submitted the victim's corpse for examination, but that route would take time. During that time, they turned to family and friends. Krzyzewski's claims of the victim being a recluse proved untrue. People linked to Hernan painted her as one who would never take her own life. Things unraveled when Hernan's will named Krzyzewski as the sole heir. This drew the attention of the victim's cousin, who went to the police with concerns that the will wasn't genuine. Something fishy was going on here. Further investigation led to Krzyzewski's arrest in July 2019 after a warrant went out the previous month. Search of her home was also conducted. It eventually came to light that Krzyzewski had been engaging in fraudulent activities involving Hernan's finances. She wrote fake checks, spent the victim's money, and more. Between all of it, it's estimated that Krzyzewski got her hands on nearly $300,000 of Hernan's money. Hernan's autopsy revealed a detail that should have been shocking, but at this point, it wasn't too hard to see coming. The substances found around the victim's body weren't the cause of death. Instead, the victim died from a massive intake of tetrahydrosaline, the main ingredient of many over-the-counter eye drops. Taking eye drops through the eye as they should be will never put you near a lethal dose. You'll probably just cry it all out. Instead, the eye drops would have to be ingested. The circumstances here were simply too suspicious to ignore. Not only had the victim gone out via a bizarre self-elimination method, but someone staged the scene to look more conventional. When police confronted Krzyzewski with all of this, she pulled out several details she hadn't revealed before. Chief among these was the claim that Hernan had made a habit of drinking Visine long before the fatal dose. In one instance, she claimed that Hernan asked to be handed a water bottle containing six vials of eye drops. Krzyzewski was at a loss to explain why she complied, though she did note that she thought the victim had, by that point, built up an immunity. Before she was arrested, Krzyzewski seemed to tell on herself by calling the cops and asking about the toxicology results in the case. She said they'd probably find something interesting if they looked. The results weren't shared with her until after her arrest. The story changed up a bit when Krzyzewski was formally accused. She said the victim must have faked taking her own life alone, but couldn't say why. 
Additionally, she asserted that she had never given the victim any eye drops, despite noting that Hernan was fond of the substance. A cellmate in the Waukesha County Jail uncovered perhaps the clearest evidence yet in the case. The inmate claimed that Kurzuski had a breakdown in her cell and confessed. The confession, however, included the sentiment that Kurzuski believed she had committed a merciful act. She knew what everyone would think, but swears that's not why she did it. Court records indicate that Kurzuski claimed to have some evidence to back up her claims. She said that a storage unit contained a recording of the victim's will, signed papers, vicine bottles, and other pieces that would be of interest. She asked to be let loose to get the items, but her request was denied. From there, the story changed again. Now, she said the items were buried in a nearby park and freezer bags. She was never set loose to get the buried treasure, as they feared she'd skip out on her $1 million bail. Instead, authorities used a map that Krzyzewski drew up and even video called her from the park. The alleged evidence was never found. While circumstantial evidence was piled high, there's nothing solid to point at Krzyzewski. For Krzyzewski, committing a money-motivated murder wouldn't be entirely out of character. She's got a record stretching back to 2005 rife with fraud and other financial transgressions. Multiple cases paint her as a serial fraudster, and all the evidence in this case points to more of the same. Hernan's financial activities began to reflect Krzyzewski near the end. It's worth noting that Krzyzewski also has a gambling problem. As anyone who's been down that road or dealt with an addict will tell you, that would provide sufficient motivation. Number 1. Scammy Daycare in 2021, a Melbourne woman named Ola Uda and several partners were caught in a massive sting operation targeting scammers taking federal funds. Uda was allegedly in the driver's seat of a daycare with fraudulent enrollments, among other illegitimate enterprises. Uda and partners stand accused of scamming some $15 million in taxpayer dollars. Uda was the sole owner of Prime Family Daycare out of Thomastown. Authorities found that many children listed as enrolled at the facility weren't receiving care at all. Uda used these ghost kids to pull down massive government funding through childcare subsidies. Additionally, she took full advantage of the country's job keeper program by netting $2.4 million in federal payments for a restaurant she ran with partner Amjad Shihada. Uda's alleged scam empire funded her high-end lifestyle. Multiple social media posts flaunted her travels, high standard of living, and expensive items like cars, clothes, investment properties, and jewelry. Uda was the most prominent of the alleged fraud ring in showing off, but authorities assert that others involved also scored substantial sums. The Instagram account that once served as Uda's stage went private. In Uda's case, not all of the wealth on display was her own. In one photo, she's seen posing with a Maserati Ghibli. This model from the premium manufacturer costs between $70,000 and $110,000, depending on the configuration. The catch? The car didn't belong to her. It was on lease by a company her husband owned, despite bearing a vanity plate that said L Boss. The money that Uda got from her fake daycare and rural ease came from federal government subsidies. Australia's child care subsidy payment system was the vehicle for the fraud. The scheme was made possible because, like some private school scholarship programs, payments aren't made to the parents. Instead, the money from the program is put directly into the hands of the providers. The parents play a minimal role. This means that all Uda needed to carry out her plan was a bit of creative forgery and the time and effort to create fake parental accounts in federal databases. She cut out the middleman and could easily approve and route payments to her bank account. The JobKeeper program, meanwhile, was Australia's answer to COVID-19 and the strain it put on businesses. The program pays out to companies so they can maintain payroll. Business owners first submit proof of payment to employees with various parameters required to qualify. Employees can qualify if they make at least $1,500 every two weeks before taxes. Once an employee is considered qualified, the federal treasury will pay out $1,500 every other week for each qualifying employee. In the same way that Uda created fake parents to appease the feds, they made fake employees for the restaurant. They also fudged payment info to get payments for some employees who wouldn't have qualified or would have required the employer to make top-up payments on the difference. The sting operation that caught Uda and her partners was a small part of a much larger operation. Scams in the same vein as hers are far from unheard of. Daycares and schools using fraudulent means to obtain government funding are fairly common. This, of course, means that such cases hit the news often. In an ironic twist that lightly sprung from a guilty conscience, Uda caught wind of one such scam in her industry and went off. The case in question landed in the publication, A Current Affair, and caught her attention. Taking to her Facebook soapbox, Uda called the scam disgusting and said that such fraud is wreaking havoc on the childcare industry. As mentioned above, 
The sting operation that took Uta down was one of immense scale. Over 11 months, agents focused on uncovering scams like hers. Over 150 officers of the Australian Federal Police were involved. 110 members of four different federal departments helped them out. The operation culminated in raids on 10 properties across Victoria and New South Wales. In Uta's case, officers pulled her from her private home in Doncaster East. This all happened near the end of 2020. Prime Family Daycare's license to receive federal payments was suspended first, then finally canceled in August 2021. Uda's LinkedIn profile has seen radio silence since the story broke, but still lists her as a proprietor of that establishment. Authorities mentioned that it could take a while to figure out how much money went missing and what charges would come from it. The most recent news says Uda and her associates are facing various fraud charges, with the heftiest one being conspiracy to cause a loss to the Commonwealth. Iraq veteran Brian Kolfaji and his wife Ashley lived a flashy, high-flying lifestyle. They documented their very public, private lives through plenty of their social media posts. The couple spent money on things such as cars and boats, home remodeling, plastic surgery procedures, and jewelry. Money wasn't the only thing they had going for them. In addition to meeting with President Trump, his family, and his inner circle, Brian and Ashley also rubbed shoulders with celebrities. One social media photo showed him and his wife alongside actor Tony Sirico, best known for his work in the HBO series The Sopranos. Where did all this money and fame come from? Through Colfaggi starting the organization, We Build the Wall. In the aftermath of the attacks in 2001, Brian Colfaggi was one of the countless Americans who felt the need to fight for his country. He enlisted in the Air Force and was deployed to Kuwait in 2003. The following year, he expressed interest in Iraq but was initially turned down. However, his request was ultimately granted when another volunteer decided not to go. While in Iraq, he worked as an air cargo inspector until September 10, 2004. That day, Brian got caught in an explosion, costing him both legs and most of his right arm. Colfaggi spent the next year at Walter Reed Medical Center and emerged as a national hero. He received a Purple Heart commendation and went on to study at the University of Arizona, graduating from their architecture program in 2014. He also flirted with the world of politics after his injury. One of his most notable acts in the arena was a campaign advertisement in which he urged voters to support Democratic U.S. Representative Gabrielle Giffords of Arizona. In 2012, the lawmaker invited Colfaggi as her guest to the State of the Union address in D.C. His personal life flourished after he returned home from Iraq. When he moved back to Arizona, he reconnected with an old acquaintance named Ashley he met while she worked as a server at a local Chili's. Brian and Ashley got married in 2011, and their family grew with the addition of two kids over the next few years. When Colfaggi drew controversy regarding his involvement in a fundraising scam, his wife attracted some attention of her own with a series of social media posts. She frequently uploaded images of herself in a bikini to Instagram and TikTok accounts as she reiterated her confidence that her husband could beat the charges against him. Aside from a few high-profile appearances related to his heroic military service, Colfaggi led a relatively quiet life with his family in Florida until the election of Donald Trump in 2016. During the Trump years, Colfaggi made a name for himself as an anti-immigration activist. Part of his public campaign to fund a border wall between America and Mexico came in the form of a fundraising effort launched on the GoFundMe platform. The resulting organization was called We Build the Wall and was touted as a way for private individuals to provide the money necessary for such a lofty construction job. The fundraiser collected more than $25 million through mostly small donations. Colfaggi solicited donations on GoFundMe fund me in late 2018, but soon announced his intention to form a non-profit organization to handle the influx of contributions. About midway through 2019, construction was completed on a section of wall spanning less than one mile near El Paso, Texas. The portion of the wall cost between $6 million and $8 million, though Colfaggi and others connected to the organization promised supporters much more progress on the barrier. His efforts attracted support from some notable Republicans, including former Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, 
News of the project even made its way to the White House, reportedly prompting Trump to say, the project has my blessing, and you can tell the media that. Quote, that would come back to bite him later on. The plan, according to organizers, was to build sections of the wall on private property along the border in California and Texas. Serious questions surfaced about how they used the money. One of the prominent political figures who spoke out in defense of We Build the Wall was one-time Trump advisor Steve Bannon. Bannon, a political strategist who initially attracted attention as the executive chairman of the right-wing Breitbart news site, joined the Trump campaign in 2016. After serving as the chief executive officer during the campaign, he was named Trump's chief strategist and senior counselor. He maintained that influential position until he left the White House about eight months after Trump's inauguration. After leaving the Trump administration, Bannon became involved in the We Build the Wall organization. Along with two other political figures, he joined forces with Colfaggi to address skepticism and suspicion on the part of GoFundMe and a growing number of critics. Instead of working to quench these concerns and provide transparency about the influx of donations, prosecutors say the organizers created a complex scheme, funnel contributions through a series of fake companies. In the end, Bannon and Colfaggi kept much of that money for themselves and funded a lavish lifestyle with money that was supposed to go toward constructing a border wall. Colfaggi attempted to reassure donors that he wasn't personally profiting from the fundraiser. However, the evidence presented during the trial said differently. Brian brought in roughly $350,000 in the form of a $20,000 monthly salary and a $100,000 bulk deposit. As for Bannon, investigators determined that he skimmed about $1 million off the top. Although a portion of that money made its way to Colfaggi's bank account, the rest allegedly went toward personal expenses, including credit card payments and hotel stays. Trump attracted widespread support on the right for his plan to build a wall along the nation's southern border. Therefore, when Colfaggi launched his organization, millions of dollars in donations poured in. Within the first three days of accepting contributions, We Build the Wall amassed a staggering $9 million. The money primarily came from Americans who aligned with Trump's Make America Great Again agenda and believed their contribution would help fund a border wall. By the time the scheme fell apart, the project had a war chest of about $25 million. Meanwhile, donors wondered where all of this money was actually going. In reality, a federal indictment asserted that the organizers siphoned a significant amount of money from the fund, which they spent on their own expenses. Colfaggi bought a boat, a high-end vehicle, and a golf cart. He also paid off his taxes and credit card bills. Meanwhile, his wife wasn't shy about posting images of their possessions on her social media pages. In one update, she told her followers they could find us on the boat. For his part, Colfaggi regularly updated his feed with pro-Trump posts, including one image of a boat adorned with a Trump 2020 flag. He also bragged about scoring a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the former president's son, Eric Trump. As troubling evidence mounted regarding how organizers spent the donated money, a bombshell video appeared to show Bannon and Colfaggi joking about scamming donors out of their money. The video was recorded in June 2019, about a year before the two men got arrested. Its purpose was to bring in even more money during what they called a wallathon fundraising event. During one segment, Bannon and Colfaggi joke when Bannon claims they were on Brian's million dollar yacht. You can hear Colfaggi laughing as Bannon says the triple amputee took all that money from the We Build the Wall coffers. Bannon retracted his comment about the pair being off the coast of Saint Tropez in southern France, insisting they were broadcasting from New Mexico. When evidence of their scam came to light, people paid closer attention to Bannon's apparent inside joke. Several social media comments suggested that the two men openly confessed their crimes, including one Twitter user who wrote, All criminals secretly want to get caught. By June 2019, investigators with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services dug into some unusual details surrounding We Build the Wall. Specifically, they cited media reports saying the organizers misused about $1.7 million in donations, but the probe soon uncovered other troubling issues. For starters, authorities say the nonprofit organization falsified information in its initial application with the agency. Additionally, Colfaggi was the only director listed on the organization, even though state law dictated that all nonprofits must have at least three individuals in such a position. The other information compiled by the department was evidence that We Build the Wall operated a fundraising raffle in violation of state laws and regulations. The organization's budget also raised red flags, particularly the nearly $80,000 set aside for unspecified fringe benefits and $700,000 salaries. 
The investigation that ultimately resulted in federal charges can trace its roots back to a Snopes article highlighting claims about a yacht that Colfaggi allegedly bought with his ill-gotten cash. Those accusations stemmed from an anonymous blog post that clearly sought to cast him in a negative light, but evidence continued to pile up that all pointed to the likelihood that Colfaggi was running a scam. He defended himself by claiming the boat he purchased was funded by the sale of another boat, but by that time he was already facing some serious criminal consequences. Although much of the stolen money from We Build the Wall went directly to Colfaggi, the indictment asserted that his wife also received fraudulent payments from the fund, which were labeled as media expenses in an apparent effort to cover their tracks. Shortly after Colfaggi was arrested, his wife addressed the claims that she personally benefited from the scheme. After asserting that she believed her husband was innocent, she added, I make my own money with all the stuff that I do. I haven't spent a penny of his money on all of that. As for what she claimed as her source of income, Ashley described herself as a brand influencer and a model for an energy drink company. She included photos and videos depicting the couple's luxurious lifestyle and plenty of racy photos of herself in skimpy bathing suits. In August 2020, authorities took Colfaggi, Bannon, and two other individuals into custody on charges related to the scheme. Bannon continued benefiting from his connection to Trump, who issued a pardon before leaving office to guarantee that his former advisor could not be convicted. Colfaggi, on the other hand, yeah, wasn't as fortunate. Along with Timothy Shea and Andrew Badalato, he was on his way to a federal trial to face charges related to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fraud. Shea was accused of operating a shell company that helped launder the money. At the same time, Badalato, a conservative political writer, was married to the organization's treasurer and allegedly received donations via a post office box set up for such deliveries. Colfaggi and Badalato appeared in federal court in April 2022 to plead guilty to conspiracy charges related to wire fraud. They face up to 20 years behind bars upon sentencing, which is scheduled for September of 2022. Shea pleaded not guilty. Despite pardoning Bannon and reportedly approving the fundraiser earlier, Donald Trump went on the record to insist that he was not a supporter of We Build the Wall. He said, I don't like that project. I thought it was being done for showboating reasons. It was something I very much thought was inappropriate to be doing. As Colfaggi prepares for the possibility of spending years in prison, this case serves as a reminder to anyone who might consider donating to an online fundraiser. And it doesn't matter who's putting it on or how much you agree with the cause. There could still be a professional scammer behind the curtain. February 2020 was a big month for Ormius Global. The cryptocurrency company was worth millions of dollars and they wanted the world to know it. That same month, the company posted a photo of a glitzy Times Square ad on Twitter. Ormius investors were ecstatic and anyone who saw the ad most likely had no clue about how Ormius worked. In truth, only two people knew the answer, John Barksdale and his sister, Tina Barksdale. Ormius was a giant scam and not worth anywhere near $250 million. The Barksdale siblings love traveling. Their Facebook and Instagram pages are filled with selfies in London, the Maldives, Singapore, and China. As the photos show, they typically travel together or with another sibling. These trips were long and often cost the siblings thousands of dollars. A seven-day trip to Singapore costs a little over $3,000, and a week-long trip to London costs around $3,500 for two people. China costs around $2,000 a week, and that's if you Google cheapest trip to X. We can safely assume the Barksdales were spending way more. A post on John's Facebook profile claims he'd been to 61 countries in three years. His ultimate goal was to touch down in 100 countries before the five-year mark. But traveling expenses weren't that big a deal to a couple of successful crypto programmers. Social media posts showed the Barksdales were smart, cultured people who supposedly created the most brilliant crypto mining operation the world had ever seen. John Barksdale started selling Ormius coins in 2017. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin reached new all-time highs while smaller coins gained traction. Society, or those tech-savvy enough to understand, accepted crypto into mainstream investing. They heard stories about a, a few lucky investors making fortunes after entering the crypto market. And of those not-so-tech-savvy individuals, the boldest risk-takers were drawn to crypto like prospectors to the gold rush. John was aware of this new reality. He founded Ormius Global alongside the mining operation to serve as the marketing entity. Due to its purpose, Ormius Global was arguably more important than the actual mining operation. Good marketing was more beneficial in the grand scheme of things than making a sustainable crypto mining system. The Barksdale siblings wanted to create a hype around Ormius coin, the likes of which the world had never seen. In the investing world, hype is a massive driver of capital. New, excited investors buy assets like stocks or crypto because early investors
users bought in first. It's the same social force that leads to trends and viral video. However, in crypto's case, large amounts of money are usually involved. And if the hype suddenly disappears, so does the money. That's why John needed a gimmick to catch people's attention and get them excited while also sounding safe. He decided to advertise Ormius as a new digital money system. The system would run on a fully audited industrial crypto mining operation. That's also a stable coin tethered to a fiat currency. If you're a conservative crypto enthusiast, all this sounds great. If you're not an enthusiast, then you may be a bit confused. Crypto mining is pretty simple to grasp once you shed the lingo. The process of mining crypto varies from currency to currency, but generally the gist is the same. Crypto can't be printed like paper money. There's no government, CEO, or team of programmers creating new coins on a digital printer. Take Bitcoin, for example. Bitcoin is a currency everyone is familiar with, even those who don't know anything about crypto. Bitcoin is generated by miners who use high-powered computers to verify transactions on the server. In exchange for their computational power, miners receive Bitcoin if they're the first to verify the transaction. These transactions are essentially complex digital puzzles that pop up every time other Bitcoins already in circulation are bought or spent. Put another way, Bitcoin miners serve as auditors who help mint new coin. No one would be able to buy or sell Bitcoin without them. There are some downsides to mining Bitcoin, though. Miners get Bitcoin when their computers solve the puzzle first, but the computational power required to mine even a single coin is barely worth it for some people. For example, Bitcoin takes 53 days worth of power for the average American household to mine. It also takes a lot of time to mine crypto, especially Bitcoin, which can take months to mine. You also have to really know your computers and be willing to spend money on expensive equipment. These downsides and barriers keep many people from mining Bitcoin. John wanted to remove those deterrents. He wanted to offer investors a better, more lucrative mining system that didn't require much coding to make money. Ormius, in a nutshell, is a building full of giant, high-powered computers designed to mine the most valuable cryptocurrencies using an industrial mining system. If you're unfamiliar, an industrial mining system is basically a facility that mines crypto on a massive scale. Think of industrial mining as a 100-acre crypto farm. Industrial mining isn't exactly innovative, however. For example, China has enough mining farms to produce 65% of the world's Bitcoin. John didn't want to compete with China, though. He wanted to create a superior mining operation that benefited consumers, or at least appeared to do so. He and Tina put on roadshows to explain how Ormius worked and how easily their coin could make money. John also advertised on social media, claiming that Ormius was going to be one of the most extensive mining operations in the world. John and Tina backed up their fantastical claims with more specific claims about how their state-of-the-art system worked. They particularly loved talking about their subscription offers and referral services. Ormius had two primary subscription packages. One for not-so-serious investors, and another for serious investors. Both were expensive. The bronze package for not-so-serious investors was $999. The Platinum Founders package, the most prestigious subscription deal, cost a much heftier $250,000. However, the value you received in return for your subscription was well worth the fee, at least according to John and Tina. Much of that value was centered around the trading bot. The bot was designed to do what every investor wants, maximize profit. John's bot would, in theory, pick the most valuable currencies that day, which would, you guessed it, maximize profit. The bot, they claimed, could also trade currencies on crypto exchanges for a 160% return, a mammoth-sized profit, even by crypto standard. Over their four-year run, John constantly announced updates on the operation's monthly revenue. He threw around some extraordinarily high sums, like $5 million per month. At its peak, John claimed Ormius was bringing in $8 million per month in revenue. To show the investors how successful the mining operation was, John developed the Ormius Reserve. The reserve was the total sum of crypto that Ormius had mined so far. Investors and potential investors could see how the mine was growing. The reserve was designed to create a sense of satisfaction in the current investor and FOMO in the potential investor. It was designed to stabilize cryptocurrencies collected inside the reserve. The stabilizer was dubbed the vault. On Ormius's white paper, John was a big advocate for stablecoins whose value is matched to a government-regulated currency like the US dollar, for example. Conservative crypto investors like stable coins because they provide the benefits of crypto with the innate stability of the dollar. Ormius was that and more. They claim that 40% of the reserve revenue was reinvested back into the company. The reinvestment money would go towards buying more mining equipment, which in turn would help increase the size of the reserve. Everything about the reserve sounded too good to be true by design, and that design worked perfectly. John and Tina used this marketing strategy to lure in thousands of investors and subscribers to Ormius and 
claimed the funds of nearly 20,000 investors. Of course, none of these investors knew until they'd been scammed until John and Tina were arrested. 2019 was a rough year for John. Ormius had been mining for two years now and didn't have much to show for it. John's operation had only generated $3 million that year, not even half of the monthly revenue they claimed to be producing. According to prosecutors, John and Tina eventually decided their groundbreaking mining system wasn't working and abandoned it. Instead, they turned their full attention to recruiting more investors. There was one problem, though. None of the investors, or potential investors, knew the mining system wasn't operational. John never told anyone and continued marketing Ormius as usual. A Times Square ad which claimed the reserve had just reached the $250 million mark circulated on their website and social media pages. From the outside, all seemed well with Ormius. After 2019, the reserve became much more than a marketing ploy. It was a mask. John wanted to hide the failure of his revolutionary mining operation while maintaining their lavish lifestyle, which was getting bougier and bougier every month. To keep up, the savvy siblings had another gimmick in their arsenal, multi-level marketing, aka let's run a pyramid scheme. They offered existing subscribers a 7-20% commission on the subscription fees of any new investor, giving existing subscribers big incentive to find more Ormius consumers. Offerings like the new subscriber commission helped pay for John and Tina's traveling expenses. By 2019, they were taking more trips than ever. The indictment filed against them estimates that they'd spent millions going to 20 different countries per year for three years. They'd also bought expensive homes. Tina owned houses in New York, Washington, D.C., and Ohio. John, meanwhile, lived in a nice house in Thailand. These expenses relied on the $124 million the siblings stole from their subscribers, who in 2021 still believed Ormius was worth $250 mil. In reality, it was worth $52 million. The $250 million sum that graced Times Square in 2020 was fake. The reserve was actually an image of someone else's Bitcoin wallet. Investigators eventually figured it out and arrested John and Tina. They found Tina in Hong Kong, which housed Ormius's headquarters. Then they caught up with John in Thailand. Authorities sent John to New York, where he's currently facing up to 65 years in prison for his many criminal charges, including one count of securities fraud, one count of wire fraud, and one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. As of May 2022, John is 40 years old. If he gets the maximum sentence, he may never get to travel again. As for Tina, we'll have to wait and see where her legal road takes her. The Barksdale scam, while bizarre, is just another crypto scheme in the eyes of the world's governments. In 2021 alone, victims lost an estimated whopping $14 billion to crypto scams like Ormius. The enormous figure has finally caught the attention of Western politicians. In March of 2022, President Biden signed an executive order that ensures order and responsibilities for the development of digital assets. In other words, the order is a set of guidelines for how crypto should be regulated. The goal, of course, is to protect investors. Legal experts from Sherman and Sterling say the order won't solve all the intricacies of a clever crypto scam. Still, it's a big step in the regulatory direction. However, crypto's deregulated state is what attracts so many to the currency. As governments try to step in, will they be met with backlash from the crypto community? It's a tricky catch-22. On the one hand, you have regulations aiming to protect investors from crypto scams, the same way the SEC protects them from financial scams. On the other hand, you lose the very core of cryptocurrency. In 2016, Philip Esformes, the owner of more than 30 nursing homes and assisted living facilities in the Miami area, was charged with the largest criminal healthcare fraud case in U.S. history. This Medicare fraud and money laundering scheme made Philip a $1 billion profit between 2009 and 2016. Along with Philip, a hospital administrator and physician's assistant were also named in the indictment and charged with conspiracy, money laundering, and healthcare fraud. Philip, the 47-year-old, already wealthy healthcare businessman, used the scam to fund a lifestyle full of private jets, meetings with escorts and fancy hotels, personal basketball coaches for his son, and a $600,000 watch, the same one that hip-hop artist Drake showed off at a Raptor 76ers game in 2019. The watch, a Patek Philippe, is rose gold made of sapphire glass and features 1,343 diamonds on the case, bracelet, and dial. Philip wasn't shy about flashing as well. The Esformes Network, his operation of nursing homes and healthcare facilities, 
targeted the government-run programs of Medicare and Medicaid, which serve as health insurance plans for the elderly and impoverished. The indictment claimed that Philip and his associates billed Medicare and Medicaid for services that the residents at his facilities didn't need. Philip is responsible for stealing more than $1 billion from government health care programs meant to help people who are genuinely in need. $221 million of this came from fraudulent claims alone. This fraudulent billing cycle went on for 14 years. Assistant Attorney General of the Justice Department, Leslie Caldwell, called it the largest single criminal health care fraud case brought against individuals. According to the indictment, he used some money to pay his escorts travel and transportation expenses. In 2014, he self-reported a personal income of $78 million. The money allowed him to withdraw $4.8 million of cash, lease $2.4 million worth of luxury vehicles, purchase watches for $360,000 and $600,000, and pay $8.9 million bucks in credit card bills. He paid another $15.4 million to resolve a civil case of health care fraud for admitting two assisted living residents into a Miami hospital for no apparent reason. But he did not act alone. Odette Barca, the 49-year-old director of outreach programs at Larkin Community Hospital, and Arnaldo Carmus, a 56-year-old physician's assistant, were also arrested and charged for their role in the crime. Philip and Odette were also charged with obstructing justice. Odette's job was to expand the network of corrupt healthcare providers willing to partake in Philip's scam. She bribed physicians and hospitals with money in exchange for patient referrals to the Esformes network, even though it's illegal to refer patients for services billable to Medicare or Medicaid. It's also illegal to receive or give out bribes for healthcare referrals, but that one was obvious. After Odette was subpoenaed by a grand jury in 2016, she created fake medical director contracts to hide the bribe payments she made in exchange for patient referrals. She was trying to recruit more patients to the Esformes network facilities in the Miami area. Carmuz was the physician's assistant who falsified medical records to explain why the government had to pay for medication, treatment, visits, and equipment. Philip was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but former President Trump commuted his sentence before leaving office office. In the United States, a sitting president has the power to pardon someone for their crimes, which means that their sentence will be completely eliminated. Donald Trump was known to issue several presidential pardons. In December 2020, he issued 26 pardons to friends and allies, including Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, and Charles Kushner. One of the most infamous presidential pardons was new president Gerald Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon just weeks after Nixon stepped down amid the Watergate scandal. It was highly controversial and may have impacted Ford's loss in the next presidential election. However, Philip wasn't pardoned for his crimes. Instead, he was commuted. This means that his prison sentence was reduced, but not completely eliminated. Unlike pardons, commutations don't restore a prisoner's civil rights or require the prisoner's consent. A statement released by Trump's press secretary said that Philip was already appealing his sentence because of an overly aggressive prosecution that used illegally gathered evidence. Philip's health was apparently declining in prison, but this claim was quickly debunked when photos leaked of Philip dancing at his daughter's wedding just 20 days after being released from prison. Philip only served four years out of his 20-year prison sentence. Federal prosecutor Paul E. Pelliche slammed the presidential pardon of Philip Esformes, calling it a kick in the teeth to the agents and prosecutors who were working hard to defend justice for people whose livelihoods and money was stolen from them. Pelliche wanted Philip to serve a long sentence to try to make an example out of what happens to criminals who steal from government programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Philip's scam fell festered for over a decade before the government finally caught on. Florida has a large elderly population, making it a hotbed for Medicare billing fraud and Medicaid scams. Health regulators constantly criticize Florida's inability to keep tabs on ongoing health care fraud cases. As the head honcho of the Esformes network, the group of assisted living and nursing home facilities owned and run by Philip, he made corrupt decisions that endangered his patients to grow his own fortune. For example, some of the residents at his facilities didn't qualify for some aspects of care because they weren't ill or injured enough to need it. However, the Esformes network insisted on treating them anyway
way so that they could bill Medicare and Medicaid for the procedures and treatments. In some cases, this meant prescribing drugs to the point of addiction. Some patients became addicted to narcotics and felt they couldn't leave the s as network because they wouldn't be able to fill their prescriptions. This way, Philip could keep patients in his system to grow and maintain a cycle of fraud. According to Medicare and Medicaid guidelines, a patient can stay up to 100 days at a nursing facility after a hospital stay. Patients are allowed an additional 100 days if they spend six days outside a facility or are readmitted to a hospital for three more days. When patients reach the maximum number of days in a facility allowed by Medicare and Medicaid, the Esformes network would just send them to another of their many healthcare locations. This was done by a corrupt physician who would see the patients and coordinate readmission to the same or a different facility. Not only did they falsify patient treatment records, but they also inflated the price of the equipment and medication used. Philip and the Esformes network accepted kickbacks and bribes to gain business and fill his facility. But his friends insist Philip wasn't motivated by greed. Instead, success drove him over the edge. Philip's indictments also states he sold Medicare patient names to a corrupt pharmacist, which resulted in the arrest of Guillermo and Gabriel Delgado. At the trial, some as former as network staff took the stand as witnesses to testify against Philip. They said Philip would tell them to pay doctors in cash using the code word fettuccine. As the scam grew, staff were directed to inflate invoices to account for huge kickbacks and bribes. At his sentencing, Philip sobbed for 16 minutes about how sorry he was for the embarrassment he caused friends and family and the crimes he committed against his patients and the federal government. He called himself arrogant and admitted to cutting corners in healthcare. There was no one else to blame but himself. By the time he was sentenced in 2019, Philip had already spent three years in jail. He was convicted of 20 counts of money laundering, receiving healthcare kickbacks, bribery, conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. Prosecutors also sought $38.5 million in assets. The jury however, didn't reach a verdict on the main charge of Philip's attempt to defraud Medicare. Prosecutors vowed to retry him on this in addition to five other counts. Philip immediately appealed his sentence, but lucky for him, he spent only one more year in prison before he was commuted by President Trump in 2020. Commutation allowed him to escape prison, but required supervised release and a $43 million restitution. As of April 2021, he still owed $5.3 million of restitution in order to forfeit $38 million. Philip was far from the only one to benefit from the scam. He paid former Ivy League basketball coach Jerome Allen $300,000 in bribes to admit his son to the University of Pennsylvania. At the trial, Allen testified that he wouldn't have recruited Philip's son if not for the bribes. Allen pleaded guilty and was sentenced to probation in exchange for his testimony. He was fined $200,000. Philip was also in contact with Rick Singer, a college admission consultant whose name was at the center of the college admission scandal. He discussed he discussed his son's SAT scores with Singer and how he could improve his child's chances of getting into college. His daughter also benefited from the scam with a lavish wedding held at her parents' luxurious multi-million dollar beachfront mansion on New Year's Eve. The wedding was so loud and obnoxious that it angered several neighbors who received a champagne gift basket in advance as an apology for the noise. One of his neighbors took to Twitter to say that after Philip was released from prison, he had his home landscaped, re-roofed, and deep cleaned all in over two weeks. To many, this wedding felt like a slap in the face of the American people whose tax money pays for Medicare and Medicaid, which went right into his wallet. It also offended many of the patients he endangered and the legal team who tried to restore justice against him. Not to mention, part of the reason for Trump's commutation of Philip's sentence was Philip's supposed poor health. His lawyers told a federal judge that Philip was suffering from pulmonary and upper respiratory problems, which could be lethal in the face of coronavirus. Philip's health didn't seem that poor when he was seen dancing wildly and binge drinking at his daughter's wedding. Philip's sudden clemency showed the American people how you can get the justice you're willing to pay for. In Philip's case, he had the money and connections to get himself out of prison. As a longtime supporter of Jewish synagogues and organizations, Philip had links with the Aleph Institute. This Jewish humanitarian nonprofit group works on prisoners' rights and collaborates with the White House on criminal justice issues. Philip's family donated $65,000 to the group after his indictment. His form as name is seen on a Chicago school associated with Hasidic Jews whose previous leader helped found the Aleph Institute in the 1980s. Trump's son-in-law had close ties to this particular Hasidic group. Not to mention, Philip's father was a rabbi. Alan M. Dershowitz volunteered with the Aleph Institute and said that the group played a prominent role in petitioning for Philip's clemency. But Dershowitz denied that Philip's donations had anything to do with their efforts for clemency on his behalf. Dershowitz had strong ties to Trump 
before the White House. The Aleph Institute was also involved in at least five other commutations set forth by President Trump. In April of 2021, Justice Department prosecutors vowed to a federal judge to stop at nothing to retry as formas for his role in Medicare and medical fraud. After Philip exhausts his appeals process to reduce his restitution payments, the prosecution plans to do a retrial. She's probably the worst wedding planner anyone could refer to a friend since she scammed thousands from over 20 couples. But is she worse than the girl who sold expensive vacations to exotic destinations to her friends and family? Number four, the wedding scammer. Jason and Nikki Asquith Thorpe had every reason to look forward to their big day. Then, it was almost ruined by a fake wedding planner named Dana Twiddale. The couple was taken in by her ads on social media showing past successes in rich detail. When they talked with her, they were promised a venue, decorations, food, and even a memory ladder for photos of those who couldn't make it but should have. The smorgasbord offering made the 2,800 pound fee seem cheap compared to what they would pay more prominent planners. But 2,800 pounds is way too much to pay for nothing. Jason and Nikki were in trouble when they arrived at an address given to them by Twidale. It was supposed to be the pub that would host their reception. Instead, it was just a large, empty field. They tried to contact Twidale, but she ghosted them. The couple ended up laying down an additional 5,600 pounds to save their wedding, effectively canceling their planned honeymoon. The couple went on the radio to voice their woes and learned they weren't alone. All told, 24 couples came forward with something to say about Twiddell. They had all been hooked the same way as Jason and Nikki. A reputable wedding company later came forward and said that Twiddell owed many of her early successes to outsourcing, an accusation that made all too much sense in context. Twiddell fled to nearby Benidorm as too many people caught on to her scam. This finding was mostly due to her constant posting on social media, including photos of herself soaking up the sun. When authorities made a possible match, they needed some help to be sure they had the right woman. That help came from Twidale's estranged husband, Carl. He loaned Dana around 4,000 pounds and never saw a dime of it back, and he was neither the first nor the last. When he came out publicly and asked her to sign divorce forms and move on, he got more than he bargained for. Twidale's angry clients came out of the woodwork, with some even threatening him, despite him having no idea about her scamming during their separation. Authorities contacted him, and he identified Dana to help haul her in. When Twidale was initially arrested in July of 2021, her case amounted to roughly 15,000 pounds that she was found to have bilked from would-be clients. It didn't take long for Twidale to plead guilty, and the judge handed down a five-year sentence. Authorities made a couple of nasty discoveries when trying to arrange reparations for victims. Twidale exceeded the previously reached figure, ringing in around 60,000 pounds from victims between 2017 and 2019, and she had already spent the vast majority of it. With about 600 pounds in a frozen bank account and no home or car to levy and sell, the impossible task of repaying her victims began. Number three, the fake kidnapping. In 2020, a woman and her husband in Mexico got busted faking the woman's kidnapping to wring ransom money out of her mother. In the middle of the night on May 4th, 2020, Martha Elizabeth and Juan Samuel placed a frantic call to her mother, Elizabeth in Duvigs. They told her that her daughter had wound up in the hands of kidnappers in the town of Pescara. The initial call included a quoted ransom amounting to roughly $899 to be paid as 25,000 Mexican pesos. That call went a bit off the rails compared to how movies may portray ransom calls. By the end, Iduvigs reported that she couldn't hear her daughter's kidnappers, but she heard her son-in-law in the background instead. According to Iduvigs, her daughter and son-in-law were the only ones she heard on the call. Samuel claimed that the kidnappers were hurting Elizabeth. More than a little freaked out, Iduvigs scraped together about $449 and threw it into the account she was given. This was about 10,000 pesos, less than half of what she initially was asked to pay. Any parent wanting to keep their child safe would obviously spare no expense. This cash was all she had on hand. Not paying the ransom in full came with predictable results. Samuel called back and upped the ante, saying that the kidnappers were now looking for about $1,120. This sum was absolutely out of her reach, so her next move was equally predictable. 
unacceptable. Four days later, she went to the cops. In practically no time, Sonora state authorities tracked the kidnapped couple to a hotel room in Hermosillo. The pair confessed and ended up jailed for aggravated extortion. Number two, the vacation planner. Scammer Jessica Gratorex Thomas posed as a travel agent and scammed several people in her own inner circle, but she ended up with nothing but a lengthy suspended sentence to show for her troubles. Her scam hit four different victims, promising them trips to destinations like Venice, the Maldives, and Disney World. All told, she raked in around 70,000 pounds, which she ended up paying back. Thomas is a military wife and mother, married to active duty serviceman James Thomas, a detail that played a big part in how her scam story ended. Hailing from Saffron Walden in Essex, she lived on a military base with her husband and kids while running her scam. After it all went down, her husband ended up deployed to Germany, leaving Thomas and the kids safely in the UK as of this writing. She put her crooked plans into action in 2016, saying she worked for a travel company and got an incredible deal on a vacation package for her family. The travel company changed over time, with Emirates and Virgin Atlantic being the two most prominent and well used. She bragged to whoever would listen, and when neighbor Katie Taylor Riley paid attention, the scam finally began. Thomas's interactions with Riley were always friendly, so the fellow army wife had no reason to be suspicious when Thomas offered to act as the middleman for Riley's holiday plans. Instead of paying the travel company, Riley gave Thomas the money. Over time, this amounted to 48,000 pounds, making her Thomas's most prominent victim. Riley's mother recently had a near miss with cancer, awakening Riley to her own mortality. She was more than willing to splash on experiences and lasting memories, making her the perfect prey. The first trip on the list was to Venice, but when the time came, Thomas lied about trouble at work. Riley ended up hand-waving the whole incident and rebooking for next year on Thomas's recommendation. To add insult to injury, she was even convinced at this point to throw her aunt and uncle into the mix, booking them imaginary tickets to Venice with the rest of her family. All seemed fine, but the next trip brought it all crashing down. Riley and her kids were excited to go to Disney World for a chance to ride Space Mountain and hug a giant mouse. However, Thomas had terrible news for them. She had lost her job, canceling many of the holidays booked with her employee discount. The news crushed Riley and her family, but Thomas promised a refund was on its way. Thomas also lied about a dying aunt she had to take care of. After the Disney debacle, Riley wanted to speak with Thomas's superiors. But when the scammer told her that couldn't happen, Riley called Emirates herself. There were never any trips. Thomas never even work there. The jig was officially up. Thomas was caught, and Kelmsford Crown Court hosted a quick trial in May 2020. While she had committed three other frauds, her go at Riley was the most significant and the only one that the courts could definitely prove. As such, the 48,000 pound affair got the spotlight. After obtaining a confession, Judge Jonathan Seeley sentenced Thomas to concurrent terms totaling 20 months in jail and 120 hours of unpaid labor at the court. By then, she'd already begun paying back her victims. The court just made sure she kept it up. Seeley showed special mercy in this case. He ordered Thomas's sentence to be suspended, meaning it could be served at home. According to the judge, the only reason for this was her husband's deployment in Germany. How could he care for the kids if Thomas was in jail? The suspended sentence allowed the fraudster to stay home with her children during her husband's tour of duty. Number one, the scamming son. An anonymous man out of Melbourne, Australia, was accused of stealing from his sick mother. She was too ill to manage her own money, so he decided to just take it from her. This worst son of Melbourne scammed his own mom from 2014 to 2018, ultimately stealing north of $1.1 million. He emptied her bank accounts and charged $150,000 on her debit card. Sadly, this bold breach of trust is pretty standard across the globe. What makes this one unique, however, is that most cases are perpetrated by people with some legitimate claim to power over the finances they're ravaging. Power of attorney for a dying or ailing relative is among the most common scenarios, but no such thing happened here. Instead, the scammy son helped himself to his mother's millions. Like others in other regions, Queensland's public trustee is tasked with watching over financial dealings and reporting anything suspicious to local police. In January of 2021, the game was on. The investigation followed the usual course and reached its conclusion in June of 2022. Police moved in at dawn and raided the son's home. They found enough incriminating documents to arrest the worst son in Melbourne. Click to watch one of these next videos. Daryl D. Davis came from humble beginnings from a small town called Bowie, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. He moved to the big city of Chicago to try and make it in the insurance business. He started out as a modest insurance salesman, 
and quickly gained confidence in his financial knowledge. In 2005, he started moving up in the ranks. He started two firms, Financial Assurance Corps, FAC, in Chicago, and Affluent Advisory Group, AAG, in Los Angeles. By 2008, he was a self-proclaimed life coach, media personality, and investment advisor. Davis went on the public speaking circuit as a financial coach who pledged to help people invest their wealth and build a healthier relationship with their money. He also spoke to students from low-income communities through the I Have a Dream Foundation and gave them a quick course in investing, spending, and saving. Davis held other seminars about financial planning called the Smart Money Academy and the Smart Money Millionaire. He started a podcast called Wealth of the Nation about economic issues and became the vice chairman of Operation Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching financial literacy to students. In 2009, he published a book about retirement savings called Economic Secrets of the New Retirement Environment. The book achieved moderate success and ranks number 6,740 on Amazon's best-selling books about retirement. It seemed like the perfect story about a self-made man who worked hard and got rich while helping his community learn about the economy and save for retirement. But in this story, Davis turned out to not be the hero, but the villain. Davis had carefully curated social media presence that showed him as a successful investor who mingled with celebrities, went to fancy clubs, drove sports cars, and traveled around the world. But above all, Davis liked to brag about how much he cared for the community. His Instagram bio describes Davis as a CEO, best-selling author, executive producer, and host. His Instagram page is sprinkled with pictures of him with Will Smith, Magic Johnson, Barack Obama, and other celebrities. His Pinterest describes him as an eradicator of financial illiteracy. He was respected in the investment industry and especially in Chicago and Los Angeles, where he owned and operated his two firms. The New York Times even quoted Davis in an article about retirement in 2011. Davis was also active in his faith community, a church in his hometown in Maryland. Many of his clients were church members, previous customers, or old friends. He offered them an exclusive opportunity available only to those close to him for an inside investment project with one of his firms, FAC or AAG. His customers saw Davis as a friend and fellow congregant who wanted the best for them. Davis saw the aging population as the perfect target. They saw Davis' success and were eager to let him invest their money if it meant that they could retire sooner or at least be able to make money during retirement. They trusted him. Many of his clients turned over their entire life savings to Davis. Davis touted himself as a seasonal financial advisor with over 20 years in the business. He guaranteed his clients that he would make them a profit and liked to prove his success with his fancy cars, brand name clothes, and lavish spending. Davis told his clients that they would receive fixed annual interest payments and protection against losses, that their investments would be backed by Alliance Insurance, a well-known international life insurance company. In written agreements with his clients, Davis agreed to look over their current investment portfolios and develop a new way to manage their assets in exchange for a fee. Davis and his investors pledged to work with each other to achieve their financial goals. Some clients sold other assets, believing that Davis's investments would offset or even surpass these losses. From 2013 to 2018, at least 30 people from Illinois, Pennsylvania, California, and Washington, D.C. trusted Davis with their life savings. But instead of earning money for his elderly clients, Davis spent it all. From 2003 to 2017, Davis took more than $5 million from his clients. He did this by recommending and selling securities that he called corporate bond notes with guaranteed interest rates between 7 and 20%. Other investment products offered a bonus 5 to 8% if the investor allowed the note to fully mature. In 2012, Davis started selling a multi-year guarantee bond or multi-year interest guarantee account that promised interest rates of 6 to 10% with an additional cash bonus for the initial deposit. He used different names to market this type of investment and was almost never consistent in his promotional material. Davis offered flexibility with this newer investment option, allowing clients to choose one, two, or three-year terms. 
The deal was that if they chose longer terms, they would receive higher interest payments in return. Davis created brochures and flyers about all of his investment products, using the logos and trademarks of Alliance and his other corporate partners. Davis had his clients sign documents that promised their money would be backed by Alliance Insurance and held by Wells Fargo. The documents also claimed that Davis's firms were affiliated with Nationwide Financial. Davis marketed a variety of investment plan options, like the Capital Preservation Plus account that promised large profits plus the ability to withdraw the invested money at any point. The incentive to invest with Davis was the promise for stock market-like growth without the instability or potential losses that come with the real stock market. Davis promised to make profits through the sale of corporate bond notes by AAG or FAC. Investors paid for the Davis securities mainly through personal checks made out to FAC or AAG or wire transfers to the firm's bank accounts. All accounts were owned and controlled by Davis. He was able to withdraw and deposit funds at will. When one investor asked Davis for her money, he told her that he couldn't give it to her because it was invested in a bond portfolio with the company Dimension Funds Advisors. She later found out that this firm didn't exist. And it gets worse, much worse. Davis was lying to investors the whole time about the status of their corporate bond notes. In fact, there were no corporate bond notes. So when they asked for their money back, he said he couldn't repay them because the bond portfolio wasn't liquid, in addition to many other excuses. In fact, Davis didn't have any corporate bond notes or invest in bond portfolios. His investors' money never even made it to FAC or AAG. It went straight into his personal pocket. The companies that were supposed to back his clients' investments, like Alliance Insurance, never had any involvement in Davis's business. Davis had no accounts at Wells Fargo and instead used Chase Bank and Bank of America. Alliance Insurance had no record of FAC or AAG in their partnerships. Nationwide Insurance did not have an affiliation with Davis or any of his firms. The documents he made were completely fictitious. All of his brochures were made without the other company's permission and were made with copy and pasted logos and trademarks that he had no right to be using. In summary, Davis sold fake investment products using the names of real companies and insurers in order to steal from his clients. He did not keep records of his investors' specific contributions or even keep the funds in separate accounts. Davis never had any actual investment products to sell. To keep his investors from asking questions, Davis typed and sent fake account statements to customers, showing profits of thousands of dollars per month. One client was a retired U.S. Postal Service employee who handed over more than $200,000 of his retirement savings to Davis in 2015 for investment purposes. Davis sent him false statements showing a 30% profit over 17 months. Of course, none of this profit was real, and all of his money was used for Davis's personal expenses and to pay off other investors. This man lost all but $15,000 of his retirement savings through Davis's Ponzi scheme. Another client lost more than $650,000 in retirement savings. Another client was a widow who was trying to schedule a brain surgery at the Cleveland Clinic in 2016. She needed money for the procedure and frantically contacted Davis asking if he could return her investment. But when she tried to get her money back, he came up with phony excuses about why he couldn't return it to her. In addition to the financial lies, Davis was also lying to the youth of America. He said that his Smart Money Academy, his financial planning workshop, was accredited by Advance ED, a nonprofit organization for preschools and K-12 programs. It later came to light that the Smart Money Academy was never accredited by Advance ED, like Davis claimed. Davis controlled all of the FAC and AAG accounts where investors deposited their money. He transferred funds between these accounts and other entities whenever he wanted. He used some of the money he received from new investors to pay off other investors who were asking for their money back. Records show that Davis used more than $1 million in new investments to pay off old investments. He spent the rest of the funds on advancing his scheme and financing a luxurious life. Some of the $5 million stolen from investors went towards maintaining the FAC and AAG office buildings, web hosting services, and utilities. This allowed Davis to maintain appearances so potential investors would believe that Davis and his products were legitimate. Davis also used the money to market his Smart Money Academy and pay for his participation in small business expos. Perhaps the most shocking use of investors' money 
was the at least $500,000 used to rent an eight-bedroom mansion in the Hollywood Hills, a home previously rented by celebrities. It cost $40,000 per month to rent. He spent $100,000 on airline tickets and $40,000 on luxury hotels. Other money was used to rent a home in Maryland and pick up the tab at nightclubs, not to mention the Lamborghini, Ferrari, and Rolls-Royce car rentals. Davis also used clients' money to join the Bronze Buffalo Club, an exclusive Western-themed sports club with a high price tag. He used another $700,000 to pay off personal credit card bills. He spent nearly all of his investors' money, leaving them without any retirement or life savings. In 2017, the SEC filed a civil complaint against Davis and AAG, saying that he sold himself as a financial services professional but was actually running a Ponzi scheme. The SEC won a default judgment against him in 2018. Then, the FBI opened an investigation into Davis and his firms after two of his Chicago clients, a married couple, filed a complaint. Davis violated court orders by opening new bank accounts, signing up for credit cards, incorporating a new business entity, and sending his mother to the ATM to withdraw cash on his new cards. He did all of this while lying to the SEC, FBI, and federal court. He was indicted in June of 2018, and his assets were frozen. Still, Davis continued to persuade investors to believe in him and his investment products. Just months before he stood trial, Davis collected $150,000 and used some of this to repay other investors who were demanding their money back. In May of 2021, Davis took the stand in a trial by jury in the Northern District of Illinois. He pleaded guilty to mail fraud in connection to the crime. Judge Robert Gettleman sentenced him to 160 months in federal prison, 13 years and four months for defrauding clients out of more than $5 million. While it might sound like justice was served for Davis, the villain, so many of his victims are still without the retirement funds and life savings they've been working hard for for their entire lives. David Ames was the director of the Harley Quinn Group, a hotel and resorts development company. The Harley Quinn Group was a trusted brand, as it was endorsed by many celebrities and politicians. The Harley Quinn Group worked in Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. Ames had close relationships with the prime ministers of all those countries and persuaded them to endorse his development projects. Some of the other celebrity endorsers of the Harley Quinn Group included Wimbledon winner Pat Cash, former Chelsea star Andy Townsend, South African athlete Gary Player, and TV property legend Phil Spencer. Ames ran his business from a warehouse in Basildon, Essex. He owns a five-bedroom detached home worth more than two million pounds in rural England. Ames was a gifted salesman and a sweet talker. He met with investors and sold them on the idea of luxurious beachfront resorts, apartments, and condos. He saw Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines as up-and-coming vacation hotspots that had the potential to reap huge profits. He made brochures and ads, and even assembled a dedicated sales team to market his future construction projects to prospective clients. More than 8,000 people believed in Ames and the Harley Quinn Group, and they had no reason not to. Ames was backed by prime ministers, athletes, and celebrities. He was already wealthy, with a resume full of successful past construction projects. He also didn't ask his investors to pay much. In order to be guaranteed a condo or apartment unit, they only had to pay 30% of the unit's cost. The remaining 70% would be a mortgage. It was a good deal, so Ames sold more than 9,000 units. The potential value of Ames' buildings was projected to be nearly 1.5 billion pounds. The return on investment for these units would be crazy high. Ames promised his investors a minimum of 20,000 pound profits per year from vacation rental income. When some investors raised concerns over the low 30% deposit on the units, Ames brushed it off and told people that he had extra financial backing for construction, that he would pay back over the years as his investors paid off their mortgage. It was clear to everyone that Ames had a vision. He believed the Harley Quinn Group was capable of becoming the next big resort development group. Investors believed in him too. After making sales to more than 8,000 unsuspecting investors, Ames made 6.2 million pounds in shares and dividends for himself and his family. His plan was to use their deposits to build the resorts and holiday homes he imagined. But as it turned out, a 30% deposit for each unit wasn't nearly enough to pay for the construction. He effectively needed to sell three units in order to pay for the construction of one unit. He dug himself into a financial hole. Ames thought the only way out was to continue selling more units in order 
order to pay for the ones he already sold. But as he continued on his sales ventures, he started selling units on properties he didn't own. By 2011, he stopped trying to build these vacation homes and instead started pocketing all of the profit. His investors became victims when Ames' poor financial planning resulted in a funding shortfall of nearly 1.2 billion pounds by 2012, nearly seven years after Ames launched the project. Even though he knew that his project would never materialize at this rate, he continued selling. He exposed his investors to a 100% risk of loss. Ames planned developments in 15 locations, but never broke ground in any of them. Instead, he only did work on a refurbished hotel in St. Lucia and the Buckingham Bay development in St. Vincent. Only 200 of the 9,000 units sold were ever built at Buckingham Bay, but he still sold units while knowing that the development was a complete sham. From 2006 to 2015, investors lost 400 million pounds of their savings and pensions to Ames' big dreams and unending greed. Ames' promise of a 70% mortgage for his investors was never available. It was a lie used to entice investors who wanted the ability to pay off the majority of the cost over time rather than up front. But unfortunately, none of the investors did more research on their supposed mortgage provider, so they never found out that it didn't exist. One of his employees tried to purchase a unit at Buckingham Bay herself, but felt suspicious about the 70% mortgage Ames was offering. Another Harley Quinn Group employee, Michael Slade, who worked in procurement, went to visit one of the company's properties in St. Vincent, but found the entire site chaotic. The situation was nothing like Ames promised and sold in his many brochures and sales pitches. According to Slade, a surveyor's report of the site exposed the surprisingly low value of any of the progress Ames had supposedly made on construction. Slade chalked it up to a lot of waste, poor management, remedial issues, and poor construction. But when he asked to see the contract between contractors and developers that was supposed to outline the building to be constructed on that land, what he found was a simple two-page document. It was a simple list of the types of buildings to be built without any dimensions, materials, or even dates. Ames was interviewed twice by investigators in 2013 and again in 2015. Both times he denied any wrongdoing and promised that he was making progress on the holiday homes. He maintained that he relied on advice from employed professionals and put the needs of his investors above his own. Instead of putting the money towards the resort rental units as promised, Ames' wife and son got a hefty paycheck of £10,000 per month. Only 15% of investors' money went towards construction. The remainder went to marketing materials, Ames' family, and his grand spending habits. He made generous paychecks for agents in advertising. He recruited several celebrity endorsers, including Wimbledon winner Pat Cash, former Chelsea star Andy Townsend, and TV property guru Phil Spencer. South African athlete Gary Player endorsed Ames' proposed golf course on the Marquis Estate in St. Lucia. In the promotional video, Player said he previously invested in one of the Harley Quinn Group's properties and was very happy with the results. None of these celebrity endorsers knew that Ames was running a fraudulent scheme from his warehouse in rural England. They truly believed that Ames was an adept businessman with money to spare and was able to pay for fancy marketing. One of the most ironic features of Ames' marketing tactics was the phrases, a property you can trust. He plastered the saying all over his sales blurbs and had Spencer and Townsend recite it in all of their promotional materials for the company. Ames held celebrity-sponsored tennis, golf, and football academies with marketing videos. In the videos, Ames personally explained his lofty vision for his Caribbean resorts. He predicted major tourism opportunities and received praise from local politicians, including the prime ministers of Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. This made Ames' reputation even more valuable. Investors flocked to the Harley Quinn Group as they saw prime ministers and renowned celebrities believe in Ames' mission. Sarah Tricker, an accounts manager at the Harley Quinn Group, took several calls from investors asking when their units would be built. After several years, they weren't receiving any updates from Ames about the construction. At some point, it was beyond their control. Of course, there was no problem with the bank. It was a ploy Ames used to buy time for his scheme. The real problem was that there was no money to build any of the units because Ames was pocketing all of it. Then there were the phony business contracts with a simple list of proposed buildings without any costs or terms. When 
investors did a deep dive. They saw that Ames was selling units on properties he didn't own. Some investors lost their entire life savings in the process. England's Serious Fraud Office, SFO, got involved in an investigation that revealed Ames swindled 6.2 billion pounds out of 8,000 people. The SFO revealed that Ames repeatedly ignored workings that the business was insolvent and on the brink of collapse. Meanwhile, he continued selling units to investors. Ames fired any employees who questioned his business practices or started to notice that something was wrong. He told colleagues that concerned investors needed to be put in their place in order to avoid bad press. The SFO found out that a great deal of investors' cash was spent on celebrity-sponsored publicity. Ames was charged with two counts of fraud by abuse of position. He denied the counts but was found guilty of both charges by a jury at Prospero House Nightingale Court in August 2022. Prosecutors told the jury that Ames knew he was scamming investors out of millions and was using all the profits for personal gain. The lead prosecutor, Michael Bowes, said that Ames knew that his resort construction plan was a complete, unworkable business model, yet continued to put investors at a 100% risk of loss anyway. He pointed to the 70% mortgage Ames offered, which wasn't financially feasible. Ames's wife, Carol Ann, supported her husband throughout the entirety of the nine-week trial. Both she and her husband declared bankruptcy at Southern County Court in December 2018, when 24 creditors made applications to the court. After his bankruptcy claims, Ames was barred from serving as the company director and was demoted to chairman. More than 25 witnesses were called to the stand to detail their interactions with Ames as contractors, investors, endorsers, or employees. Every one of them told of Ames's decade-long deception. The jury unanimously decided that Ames was guilty of both counts of fraud. When the jury announced their verdict, Ames hung his head in shame. Judge Christopher Heher predicted a long prison sentence to be handed down in September 2022. But the Ames family crimes didn't stop there. Back in 2014, his son Matthew Ames was jailed for three years and four months for executing a 1.6 million pound Ponzi scheme by setting up fake carbon credit and teak-free investment schemes. He promised investors an immediate 12% return on investment, which he knew wasn't achievable from the start. Matthew was a green finance industry executive who owned a company called Forestry for Life, supposedly dedicated to protecting the Amazon rainforest. Much like his father who sought out celebrity endorsers to attract investors, Matthew hired James Middleton, the brother of the Duchess of Cambridge, to support his company. Middleton posed on behalf of Forestry for Life at a carbon trading expedition in London in October 2019, even though Ames was already under investigation by the Financial Services Authority. Matthew also hired England World Cup champion Jack Carlton and renowned athlete Sir Rodney Walker to endorse Forestry for Life. He created glossy brochures that included quotes from Prince Charles and Tony Blair to promote teak plantation projects in Sri Lanka and protection of the Amazon rainforest. The company said it would offer carbon credits to investors to be used to plant trees and offset their carbon footprint. But in reality, Forestry for Life didn't purchase any land in Sri Lanka or the Amazon. Matthew didn't plant a single tree. They were offering carbon credits for rainforest land it didn't own. The firm rarely gave investors proof of purchase. Instead, he spent his money on rented Lambos, first-class travel, and five-star Caribbean villas. He spent investors' cash on meals at exclusive restaurants like Ivy in the West End and fancy hotel stays such as the Bellagio in Las Vegas, the Savoy, Hilton, and the Mandarin Oriental in Hong Kong. He invoiced his companies for a stay at the Upper House in Hong Kong and tickets to a Manchester United soccer game in Old Trafford. He boasted to investors about his plans to open offices in Dubai, Singapore, Dublin, and India. He stole 75,000 pounds of retirement savings from one elderly investor who believed Matthew's claims that the teak market was rapidly outpacing the gold and oil industries. He set up a Ponzi scheme and paid old investors with the money from new investors. The company director was finally caught after he sold fake carbon credits to an undercover reporter in August 2010. Both of his companies, Forestry for Life and the Investor Club, were liquidated in March 2011 with debts of over 1.6 million pounds. Matthew took the stand at the trial to claim that he wasn't able to plant the 5,000 saplings he pledged in Sri Lanka because he was having trouble securing the right land. He also claimed that all of his investors' money was put towards legitimate expenses. A jury of six men and six women in the Owlsworth Crown Court found Matthew guilty of two counts of fraudulent trading by majority verdict. In March 2000. 
2014, Judge Paul Dugdale sentenced him to 40 months imprisonment for swindling many members of the public, many of whom were elderly retirement savers. The judge noted that Matthew personally visited all of the investors who lost their money in the scheme to apologize, but that this should never have happened in the first place. The judge originally planned to sentence him to five years behind bars, but reduced it to 40 months for Matthew's ability to recognize his wrongdoing. Prosecutor Anthony Swift advocated for an even longer sentence, saying that the defendant was no stranger to white-collar crime after being banned from company dictatorship for 13 years, a punishment imposed on him in 2013. The defense also cited Matthew's lengthy list of personal problems, including a messy divorce that involved a custody battle over his four children. He also said that the defendant shouldn't be jailed so that he can continue working and making at least 10,000 pounds per month to pay off his investors. Maybe he had a way with computers, but with his words, not so much. CEO Du Quan became known for the way he conducted himself in interviews. He said such things like, I don't argue with the poor after receiving criticism on his cryptocurrencies. British economist Francis Coppola criticized Quan's stablecoin model, so Quan responded by calling all of his critics, quote, cockroaches. When concerned investors asked him on Twitter about the source of some of his capital yield reserves, Quan said, quote, your mom, obviously. Quan felt like he was on top of the world and didn't need to impress the public in order to maintain his success. Du Quan is a South Korean cryptocurrency developer who co-founded and became the CEO of Terraform Labs. The company, based in Singapore, created the Terra blockchain and includes the currencies Terra USD and Luna. Before he started his crypto career, Quan studied computer science at Stanford University and went on to work as an engineer at both Apple and Microsoft. In September 2015, he moved back to South Korea. Some of his former employees say that he founded a different currency called Basis based on Ethereum. But the SEC had some concerns with the currency and it was shut down. But Quan's involvement was never confirmed. What we do know, though, is that after Quan worked with Apple and Microsoft, he felt ready to start his own cryptocurrencies. So he founded Terraform Labs and established Terra USD and Luna. He rode the wave of success until it suddenly came crashing down. Now he's being called the South Korean Elizabeth Holmes. But before he was called the South Korean Elizabeth Holmes, he was the South Korean Elon Musk. In April 2022, the price of Luna reached a whopping $119. And became the first Korean currency to make it into the top 10 crypto markets in the world. Terra USD was a stablecoin, or a currency whose value is tied to that of another currency. Stablecoins are supposed to provide alternatives to people who want to invest in crypto, but are afraid of the rapidly changing markets. Terra USD was supposed to maintain a one-to-one -one ratio with the US dollar. Quan's goal was to use his cryptocurrencies to establish a decentralized economy. His confidence earned him the trust of high-profile investors, including the venture capital firm involved with Coinbase, one of the major platforms for cryptocurrency exchange. Quan was so confident in his currencies that he even named his daughter Luna after his best invention. He clearly had no idea that Luna's cash value would tank less than a year after his daughter was born. Quan also mentioned taking pleasure in watching companies fail, but he seemed to forecast his own company's failure when he said that 95% of cryptocurrencies are going to die. A few days later, Terra USD fell from its one to one US dollar ratio to 0 0.26 Terra USD to one US dollar. The crumbling crypto market urged investors to convert their Terra USD to Quan's other coin, Luna, which in turn fell 97% that day to a market value of nearly zero. It was a domino effect of failure. Over the course of a week, the company lost almost $45 billion. The reason why the Terra coins collapsed isn't completely certain, but some theories include mass withdrawals days before the collapse, general investor concerns about cryptocurrencies, and a decline in the price of Bitcoin. Terra USD and Luna, once members of the world's top 10 largest crypto markets, now held a value of next to nothing. This huge meltdown had a ripple effect throughout the crypto universe, pushing the world's largest stablecoin, Tether, below its dollar peg and sending Bitcoin and Ether into 16-month lows. Quan tried to save his company by purchasing $3.5 billion of Bitcoin. The Luna Foundation Guard announced that Quan withdrew 37,000 Bitcoins, a net worth of over $1 billion, to lend out to his struggling investors. The rest of the money would be used to buy more Terra USD and increase the value of Quan's beloved invention. But instead of saving his investors, it was like dumping water onto a sinking ship. 
Quan wanted his cryptocurrency to be reset to an inventory of 1 billion coins to be redistributed amongst investors. Other players in the field, like Billy Marcus, co-founder of Dogecoin, said that Quan should leave the crypto industry altogether. Many of Quan's unfortunate investors, who believed in his product as much as he did, lost their entire life savings in the collapse of Terra. One person lost over $450,000. Another investor, who claims to have lost more than $2 million, snuck into Quan's high-rise condo to demand an apology. He didn't get one, but Quan's wife did file a request for emergency police protection. The quick rise and fall of USD inspired people to compare Quan to the Theranos mastermind, Elizabeth Holmes. After the crash of Terra USD and Luna, some people called it a Ponzi scheme, similar to what happened to the Lehman Brothers before the 2008 recession. The United States Securities and Exchange Commission issued a subpoena to Terraform Labs and Quan in 2021 with a special interest in the company's mirror protocol, which claimed to be designed to mirror actual stocks. Quan said he couldn't comply with the SEC's demands and said that he would instead be suing the SEC. Despite his attempts to counter-sue and avoid the SEC, a court hearing in February 2022 ruled in favor of the government agency's right to continue its investigation into Quan and Terraform Labs. Then Quan's own country came after him. The South Korean Minister of Justice's Han Dong-hoon, who sent the Economic Crimes Investigation Division of Seoul to track down and seize the proceeds of criminal financial activity. On the first day of the operation, the Financial and Securities Crimes Joint Investigation Team made Terra and Luna their first targets. According to Korean investigators from the National Tax Service, Kwan's company avoided $100 million in taxes and was ordered to pay it all back in December 2021. He refused to pay on the grounds that Terraform Labs and Terraform Labs Virgin Islands aren't Korean companies. Nearly 200,000 people were affected by Luna's downfall. Some Korean investors got together to file a class action lawsuit against Terraform Labs' founders Kwan and Daniel Shin on criminal charges. As of May 2022, more than 1,600 investors signed their names on the lawsuit. In June 2022, Patterson v. Terraform Labs was filed against Quan and his associates in Northern California. Fifteen people involved with Terra were placed under travel restrictions by the Korean government. Quan is believed to be hiding out in Singapore. The activist group Anonymous uploaded a video to its YouTube channel pledging to bring Quan to justice. Both Korean and American governments cited the immense vulnerability and lack of transparency in the crypto markets that led to the currency's sudden downfall. This is especially for stablecoins, whose inherent value is tied to non-digital currencies such as the American dollar that change value during market stress. The effect of Du Quan's company affected more than just independent investors. It affected hedge funds like Three Arrows Capital, a Singaporean cryptocurrency hedge fund founded in 2012 by Kyle Davies and Su Zhu. Davies and Zhu met at boarding school and both studied at Columbia University. They founded 3AC in 2012 and almost immediately found huge success. The founders gained a large social media following for their rapid success in crypto knowledge. 3AC put the majority of its money in up-and-coming cryptocurrencies like TerraUSD, Luna, and Ethereum. In February 2022, 3AC invested over $200 million in Luna tokens alone. At one point, the company claimed a net asset value of $18 billion, including $10 billion of cryptocurrency assets. But with Terraform Labs' reputation under fire and Quan's reputation destroyed, 3AC did not have a leg to stand on. After $400 million in liquidations in 2022, 3AC faced insolvency. A short three months later, a court in the British Virgin Islands forced the company to sell all of its crypto holdings in one of the largest hedge fund trading losses of all time. On July 1st, 2022, 3 AC filed for bankruptcy. Zhu, co-founder, director, CEO, and CIO of 3 AC, was living the high life while 3 AC rode the wave of success. He used his earnings to buy properties all over the world, including three bungalows in Singapore from 2019 to 2021. The total value of these properties amounted to a whopping $84 million. Zhu's last purchase was yet another bungalow, this time in the name of his three-year-old son, for $50 million. He bought another property overlooking Singapore 
Davenport's beautiful Dalvey Street for $29 million. Another property purchased in 2019 is a $6 million unit in a luxury building called the Goodwood Grand. Zoo, together with 3AC, own five luxury properties, three bungalows, a business townhouse, a yacht, and a fleet of sports cars. These purchases might look silly now, considering the fate of 3AC, but at the time, they weren't bad decisions. Zoo had more than enough money to keep investing his fortune in properties around the globe, and no one was going to stop him, except the crypto market. In the first half of 2022, cryptocurrencies experienced major decline. Most tokens lost over 50% of their original value. After Terra USD and Luna crashed to a value of near zero, 3AC owed debts nearing $3 billion. In June 2022, 3AC was named in the class action lawsuit against Terraform Labs. Later that month, 3AC received a warning notice from the Monetary Authority of Singapore for falling below its threshold of $250 million in assets, a condition that it needed to meet in 2013 in order to register as a hedge fund. 3AC got in more trouble after giving false information to the MAS and failing to notify them about changes in leadership and shareholdings. In June 2022, the news reported that 3AC did not meet its margins. One week later, the Wall Street Journal reported that 3AC failed to repay money that was lent by crypto broker Voyager Digital. Voyager Digital issued a default against 3AC for failing to make the required payments on a Bitcoin and US dollar loan worth more than $665 billion. Voyager Digital sued 3AC and that same day, the high court in the British Virgin Islands forced the company to liquidate. 3AC declared bankruptcy on July 1st. Unfortunately for founders Sue Zhu and Kyle Davies, this was very bad timing. Instead of paying creditors back, Zhu and Davies just put a deposit down on a $50 million yacht. It weighed 500 tons and was 171 feet long with five decks and a glass bottom pool. The captain showed off pictures of the boat at parties, bragging that it would be the biggest yacht in Singapore, with plans to add projector screens for Davies and Zoo to show off their growing NFT collection. It was the biggest boat ever sold in Asia. It was a huge achievement for the crypto industry, but now we know that it was purchased with borrowed funds. The domino effect of failure started with Terra Labs and didn't end with 3AC. Voyager Digital filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in New York City in July 2022, reporting that 3AC owed it more than $650 million. Genesis Global Trading, with headquarters on Park Avenue, lent 3AC $2.3 billion and it never saw it repaid. And Blockchain.com, a digital wallet and exchange company, had $270 million in unpaid loans from 3AC and had to lay off a quarter of its staff. Many crypto analysts observed that the liquidation of 3AC led to an even greater crypto crash that caused huge currencies like Bitcoin to plunge more than 70% in value, a decline of over $1 trillion. According to court papers, Davies and Zoo haven't been cooperating with the liquidation process. As of July 8, 2022, their whereabouts were unknown, while 3AC still owes creditors over $3.5 billion. The super yacht is now sitting, abandoned, on the Italian coast since Davies and Zoo never made their final payment. It's now back on the market. In March of 2014, the producer of Wu-Tang Clan decided that it would be a sensational idea if the band recorded a 31-track album named Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. This album would come in a hand-carved box with a book filled with lyrics and notes about the song. The catch was that they were only going to make one record and they were only going to sell it to the highest bidder. Only when they finally announced that Wu-Tang Clan had sold the album, they didn't want to report to who they had traded it to. The question is, why? Why didn't Wu-Tang Clan want their fans to know who had received the album? Who was the person spending $2 million on such a prized treasure? For those who don't know, the Wu-Tang Clan was a popular hip-hop band made up of nine members. Before this album, the band was losing momentum. So their producer RZA decided that the album would be the perfect idea to bring back the fame. The Wu-Tang album garnered a lot of attention from people, including millionaires, billionaires, and trophy hunters, and a 32-year-old business owner named Martin Shkreli. Shkreli's parents immigrated to Brooklyn, New York from Albania. As janitors, they worked hard to put their son through school. Shkreli was an extremely bright kid, idolizing scientists and skipping grades. He also loved music, and that would follow him into adulthood. 
While paving his way into Wall Street, Shkreli made a name for himself on social media. Twitter was a place where he could show his wealthy bachelor side. Shkreli loved to portray himself as a young self-starter who lived a life of luxury. He often posted photos of himself holding expensive wines and standing beside helicopters. On YouTube, he created live streams where he taught others how to analyze stocks, explained how drugs work, and often made comments about things happening in the world. His YouTube persona was his nerdy side. Viewers often saw him twirling in his chair, twitching, and talking fast as if he had some form of social anxiety while filming. It showed that he was relatable as a person, and he wasn't unattainable. Overall, it was hard not to think of Shkreli as a heroic rags-to-riches story, a poor boy with immigrant parents who eventually became a notorious hedge fund manager. It gave young people the idea that they could also become wealthy. Wall Street is famous for being the place where you can earn big bucks. And sitting at the top was Shkreli. But they say the higher you sit, the harder you fall. He had founded two hedge funds before starting Retrofin, a pharmaceutical company. During this time, Shkreli became controversial and liked to purchase cheap, lesser known drugs to raise their prices significantly. In 2014, Retrofin purchased a drug called Teopronin. Teopronin is used to treat cystinuria, a rare painful kidney complication that creates kidney stones made of pure cysteine. Overnight, Teopronin jumped from $1.50 per pill to $30. Now, this is nothing new. Other pharmaceutical companies raised the prices of their drugs while putting them through new test trials and getting them reapproved by the FDA. The issue here is that Shkreli didn't do that. They purchased a drug and raised the price without trying to make the medication better in any way. But you know what they say, criminals tend to have a pattern and we'll see that pattern soon. After some controversies with his employees, Shkreli left Retrofin, leading him to starting a new company called Turing Pharmaceuticals. In August of 2015, during the closing of the Wu-Tang album deal, it came out that Turing Pharmaceuticals had purchased the drug Daraprim and raised its price from $13.50 a pill to $750. Sound familiar? Daraprim is a drug used to treat toxoplasmosis, a rare infection caused by a parasite, the most common parasite in the world. This infection can lead to stillbirths and miscarriages, and it can also lead to blindness and even death for people with weakened immune systems. So when Shkreli raised the prices that high, it put pregnant women, the elderly, and people living with HIV at extreme risk of being unable to afford their medication. Shkreli claimed that he raised the price so that Turing could have more money to research other drugs that could help with toxoplasmosis. Looking at his past with Retrofin, it seemed more like an excuse than reasoning. So it's safe to say that the public was outraged. Shkreli became the most hated man in America. Presidential candidates like Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump were even commenting on Shkreli's outrageousness. It made sense why Wu-Tang Clan didn't want to let fans know that the owner of their rarest album was a man like this. And just when Shkreli was at the height of his game, it all came crumbling down. In 2018, the board of Retrofin sued Shkreli for $65 million, claiming that he was mismanaging the company's assets and using the company's money towards his hedge funds. So the Wu-Tang album, the diaprim price hike, and being sued by his old pharmaceutical company. August of 2018 was a busy month for Shkreli. Prosecutors claimed that Shkreli defrauded millions of dollars from his investors and only repaid them using retrofin stocks. They wanted a 15-year sentence minimum, arguing that Shkreli was a danger to the people and they needed protection from him. Shkreli's defense team thought that Shkreli had the potential to do good. They also claimed that he shouldn't be convicted just because of his reputation and past controversies. In the end, the judge sentenced Shkreli to seven years in prison. Afterward, he was to have three years of probation and had to pay a $75,000 fine. When the jury gave the verdict, Shkreli cried dramatically, promising that he would start contributing to society. He said he wasn't a victim, and that the only one at fault was him. Shkreli also claimed that he didn't do it for the money. It's an interesting thing to say coming from a man who hiked up drug prices on two separate occasions. And if you're angry about the Wu-Tang album, don't worry. The government confiscated the album and sold it to a new buyer. Although they never announced how much money they made off the album, it's important to note that Shkreli's judge had ordered him to forfeit $7.4 million. She said that if he didn't pay, he would have to give up his Picasso painting, a Little Wayne album called the Carter V, along with the $5 million Shkreli posted for his bail. The sale of the Wu-Tang album had repaid the $7.4 four million dollar debt in full. It shows that for a man still worth 70 million dollars, 7.4 million dollars is a slap on the wrist. While in prison, a journalist named Christy Smythe 
had come to interview him. At this point, she was the sole journalist at Bloomberg News to cover his story. After months of meeting up for interviews, Smythe had developed feelings for him. And once she saw emails exchanged between her and Shkreli in the courtroom, she realized that she couldn't provide an unbiased account of him anymore. She requested that Bloomberg give the story to a new journalist, and shortly after, she quit the company altogether. Smythe's husband was understandably upset, telling her she was throwing her career away over Shkreli. The fights got so bad that her husband suggested couples counseling to overcome their fights. Smythe admitted to being 52 minutes late to their first one-hour session because she was visiting Shkreli in prison. Although the two attended multiple sessions afterward, their relationship inevitably ended in divorce. In December 2020, Smythe reached out to Stephanie Clifford at Elle magazine. She wanted to go public about her relationship with Shkreli, and Clifford suspected that it was because Smythe was looking for some sort of power in the relationship. After all, Smythe was at the beck and call of Shkreli. Smythe even admitted to Clifford that she remembered her professor telling her that she would ruin her life over Shkreli. When Clifford interviewed Shkreli for the article, he said he wished Smythe the best in life. Smythe stated that she knew what that meant, and she sat while Clifford practically gave her the breakup news. Even after the breakup, Smythe didn't regret her choices. Despite people claiming that Shkreli manipulated her, she doesn't believe he did. Although Smythe insisted that her life improved after meeting Shkreli, it's hard to imagine that as accurate seeing how now she has to start over in a new company without the man she left her husband for. To talk about another slap on the wrist, Shkreli didn't have to fulfill his seven-year sentence. Back in March, they released him from prison due to good behavior. He's now in a New York halfway house, only having served four and a half years. We expect his release to be on September 14th. The internet exploded when on the same day of his release, a Twitter user found that Shkreli had created an account on Bumble. Being on a dating app solidified that he and Smythe are still not together and that he has no interest in rekindling that flame. Although he hasn't confirmed or denied this account being real, it's convenient that it was created on the same day as his release. According to Smythe, she still has feelings for him and has even frozen her eggs to have a potential family with him in the future. She bears no ill will toward him and sees a lifelong friendship between them. And if you thought the story couldn't get even better, buckle up. In July, Shkreli started an online company called Druglike. They barred Shkreli from being in the pharmaceuticals industry for the rest of his life, but he claimed he still wanted to help cut drug prices. Truly a character arc indeed. Druglike is a platform where drug companies can create hypothetical chemical compounds to create new potential drugs. Along with Druglike, Shkreli also announced his new cryptocurrency, Martin Shkreli Inu. That's right, Pharma Bro transformed into Crypto Bro. It started when Shkreli tuned into a Twitter audio event where he talked about his theories for what will happen in the crypto world. People thought he was very knowledgeable and welcomed him into the community. After his dramatic show during his sentencing, Christy Smythe, raving about how he was a good guy and continuously talking about how he learned from his mistakes and wants to do good, people bought into it, literally. Then, on August 15th, Martin Shkreli Inu dropped to 90% of its value. Someone had sold more than 160 billion tokens, and the wallet that those tokens belonged to was none other than Martin Shkreli's. In the crypto world, this is called a rug pull. You wait until your coin is at a high price, then sell off what you have in your wallet, essentially tanking the value and leaving everyone else with the scraps. It's immoral, but not illegal, meaning it was the perfect resource for Shkreli to rebuild his fortune. Bloomberg News did reach out to him on Discord, and an account believed to be him claimed that he got hacked and that an investigation had started. While someone could have hacked Shkreli, it's also not likely. Remember that Shkreli is brilliant, especially when it comes to technology. He likely learned about the rug pull scam while he studied cryptocurrency in prison, and it wouldn't be shocking if it came to light that he pulled the rug himself. After seeing all the pieces, it's hard not to think that he didn't plan everything to make the people believe he was a changed man. After all, people do describe him as a master manipulator. And after watching him defraud investors, hike up drug prices, convince a woman to quit her job and divorce her husband, and potentially scam cryptocurrency users, it's hard not to believe it. Here are a few people who completely took advantage of the pandemic. Number four, a family affair. Three days after Congress approved the $2.2 trillion economic relief package during the pandemic in March 2020, Richard Avizan and his wife Marietta Terabellian applied for a $112,000 loan using the aliases Lulia Zadko and Victoria Couchko. 
first loan was filed for top quality contracting. One day later, Thadco and Couchco requested a $150,000 loan for journeyman construction. Since the government was in a hurry to provide economic relief, the loans were approved almost immediately. The huge federal loan deposits put sparkles in the couple's eyes. They spent the free money almost as fast as it poured in. Meanwhile, they kept filing loan applications using sham companies. By August 2020, they applied for 151 loans, totaling more than $18 million in pandemic relief funds. They invested $640,000 of the money in a Mediterranean-style hillside villa in Tarzana, California, with a view of the valley. They bought gold coins, diamond earrings, wristwatches, and more. One of Ivesian's most luxurious purchases was a $35,000 Rolex he bought while on vacation with his wife in Turks and Caicos. They also had $450,000 in cash stuffed in grocery bags littered across their property. They went on fancy tropical vacations and bought more high-end items for themselves. The FBI started trailing Abzian and Terabellion after noticing suspicious amounts of money entering their accounts. For months, authorities searched their trash and bank records until they had enough evidence for a case. The couple was on their way home from a Caribbean beach vacation when they were flagged by customs during a layover in Miami. Customs agents led them away to search their luggage and phones. They discovered the couple was carrying credit cards in the names of their aliases, Lulia Zadko and Victoria Couchko, the same names they used to fill out millions of dollars in loan applications. It seemed Avizian and Terabellion were operating a family fraud ring that hadn't properly covered its tracks. After hours of questioning, Avzian and Terabellion were arrested and held in jail for the night. But two weeks later, FBI agents and a SWAT team showed up at the family's Tarzana's estate in the early morning and raided the couple's 2.6-acre property. Terabellion, who was out on bail at the time, ran out the back door and tossed a grocery bag into the bushes. Agents located the grocery bag and emptied it, finding almost half a million in cash. The kids and the family dog emerged from the house and stood on the pool deck as authorities ransacked the home looking for evidence. On June 25, 2021, a Los Angeles federal court convicted Abzian, Terabellion, and two relatives of conspiracy to commit bank fraud, conspiracy to launder money, and other crimes. Four accomplices also pleaded guilty. In total, the FBI arrested eight different people involved with the scam. The jury decided that the government could confiscate the house, jewelry, gold, and all other items purchased with the pandemic relief money that should have been used to save American businesses and careers. The criminal case became a family scandal when Avzian's younger brother, Archer, took the witness stand and blamed most of the scam on his wife, Tamara Dadian. The already strained marriage between Archer and Dadian worsened when they blamed each other for the family fraud ring. Archer insisted that Dadian committed all of the crimes on her side of the house while he ran his trucking business outside of the home. When asked about the photos of fake IDs on his phone, he blamed his wife again. He said she never showed him any of the government loan applications she filed. But when loan deposits were made to his bank account, he had no problem spending them. He received $285,000 in pandemic relief funds and admitted to using some of it to buy supplies and repairs for his trucking company. He also bought a $24,000 Harley Davidson motorcycle. He invested $93,000 of it in an escrow company to help his brother purchase their Tarzana Hillside estate. After sentencing in June 2021, Dadian was supposed to report to prison in January 2022 to serve a 10-year prison sentence. But she never arrived. By February 2022, she was declared a fugitive and fled to Europe. Her whereabouts were unknown, and the FBI offered a $20,000 reward for any tips related to her disappearance. Dadian convinced her brother-in-law, Richard Avzian, and his wife, Terabellion, to go on the run with her. Federal employees believe the three of them cut off their ankle monitor bracelets after their convictions in June. Authorities finally found them in February 2022 in Montenegro. Spanish officials deported them to the U.S. shortly after. Richard Avzian was sentenced to 17 years in prison, and Terabellion was sentenced to six. Archer Avzian, Richard's brother and Dadian's estranged husband, was sentenced to five years behind bars. Dadian was sentenced to 10 years and 10 months. Number three, scammer on fire. 
Our story begins in the black summer when massive bushfires tore through Australia between 2019 and 2020. As of October 2020, the fires had burnt up to 84 million acres of land and 5,900 buildings, including 2,779 homes. Sadly, the fires also claimed 24 lives. The blaze also affected 3 billion creatures, mostly reptiles. Some species were driven to extinction, while air quality dropped to hazardous levels. An estimated $103 billion was needed to recover property and economic losses. Millions of Australian lives were affected, and the economy suffered endlessly. This only got worse when COVID-19 struck the continent. On January 6, 2020, the federal government allocated $2 billion for brush fire recovery. The money was divided between primary producers, mental health providers, local governments, charities, financial counselors, young people, and other forms of emergency funding to help get Australian citizens back on their feet. But sometimes, the money didn't end up in the right hands. That's where Ellen Howard comes in. Howard, an unemployed woman in her 30s, applied for relief payments in the states of New South Wales and Victoria, even though she didn't live in either state. She scammed the New South Wales local government by claiming her house burnt down in the bushfires. She forged fake identity documents to prove she lived there and hoped to get her hands on a $10,000 emergency payment. Though Howard's home was damaged from fire, it wasn't from the bushfires. Instead, a domestic dispute between her and an ex-partner led to an accidental fire in the house. Still, she successfully secured the $10,000 payment and then received $93,000 more in subsidies, taking money away from the people who really needed it. Howard's <laughs> greedy ways escalated when she saw new opportunities for scamming the government during the pandemic. When the Australian state of Victoria went into lockdown during COVID-19, Howard claimed her career was negatively affected, even though she was already unemployed. Howard didn't even live in Victoria. She applied for $450 support payments, 13 times stealing identity documents from family, friends, and total strangers. As a result, some individuals and businesses couldn't make their claims or receive relief money because the government thought those payments had already been sent out. Howard successfully obtained $104,000 and tried to secure $258,000 more in government and charity disaster relief funding. Howard thought the money was simply there for the taking and received the deposits easily after submitting fraudulent applications. And with that money, she went on shopping sprees, such as buying a new wallet from Louis Vuitton and posting it on Facebook. In all, Howard used multiple bank accounts and email addresses to apply for 34 relief payments. Like all of the other scams, the government finally caught up with her. In November 2020, Howard was arrested and refused bail on 16 charges of dishonestly obtaining financial benefit by deception. Police found a ledger full of email addresses used to file fraudulent loan applicants on her when she was arrested. The prosecutor said Howard was in a world of trouble. She failed to show up to court several times, and multiple warrants were issued for her arrest. The legal aid lawyer proposed very strict bail conditions, which were denied to add more restrictions to her internet use. She pleaded guilty to 11 counts of fraudulently claiming bushfire payments in New South Wales and 13 counts of fraudulently claiming lockdown payments in Victoria. She admitted to 16 dishonesty charges that amounted to $250,000 in funds from the Tasmanian government and charities. Number two, unvaccinated. Two New York nurses took advantage of their role in the pandemic and made more than one and a half million dollars in crafting fake vaccination cards. They obtained real vaccine doses, CDC vaccination cards, and syringes from the New York State Department of Health. However, they skipped the first part of the process, you know, the uh, vaccination part, and went right to the cards. Marissa Araro wrote out the fake CDC cards, and her boss, Julie Devuano, input the fake information into the New York State Health Department database. Devuano was a nurse practitioner who owned Wild Child Pediatric Healthcare in Amityville, Long Island, where Araro worked as a nurse. Two nurses teamed up to sell fake adult vaccination cards for $220 each and children's cards for $85 each. Then they would enter the information into the New York Health System's website so it was on record that these patients received the vaccine even though they didn't. The women made over $1.5 million in profits from the scheme. This equates to roughly 6,800 adult vaccination cards or 17,000 pediatric cards. Since they ran a pediatric facility, they probably handed out the cards to entire families. 
Let's say a family equals two adults and two kids. That means they handed out fake vaccine cards to about 2,400 families, charging $610 per family. With all these fake cards floating around Long Island, someone probably showed off or talked about what the nurses at Wild Child Pediatric were doing. Not only that, but local businesses noticed an odd number of patients entering Wild Child Pediatric and reported their suspicions to the police. Devuano and Araro's criminal activity was uncovered when they wrote out a fake vaccination card for an undercover detective who never received the jab. Then, police obtained a search warrant for Devuano's home. They discovered nearly $1 million in cash and a ledger showing almost $1.5 million in profit when they entered. The nursing duo apparently ran the scheme since November 2021. They were arrested in January 2022, pleaded not guilty, and released without bail. A third accomplice was receptionist Brooke Hogan, who also was arrested for her help in conducting the fake vaccination card scam. She was charged with felony forgery as well. Plot twist. Devuano's husband is an NYPD officer being investigated for potentially helping his wife fly under the radar and even referring potential customers to her. The Suffolk County District Attorney publicly shamed the nurses for using their jobs to endanger public health even though they were supposed to be protecting it. And for what? To make a buck? Araro's attorney asked the public to consider his client's career and all of her contributions to healthcare before this scandal. Number one, the mayor's daughter. When the U.S. government announced the PPP program, Damara Holness decided she wanted a piece of the pie. Damara, the former mayor of Broward County, Florida's daughter, at the time she owned Holness Consulting Inc., a political consulting firm operating out of South Florida. However, the firm was inactive and had been since 2018. Then, when the government announced the PPP program, Holness Consulting suddenly appeared back on the map. In her online application, Holness said her company employed 18 people and paid out $120,000 in payroll each month during 2019, a year when the business was not operational. In return, Holness got a juicy check for $300,000. All it took were a few fraudulent payroll tax forms and a frantic federal government. However, Holness knew she had to clean the money. So, in a sewed money laundering scheme, she paid 22 different people $1,300 every two weeks. They'd cash their checks, pocket $300, and give Holness the other $1,000. The U.S. was ripe with COVID relief fraud. It wasn't long before the COVID-19 Fraud Enforcement Task Force caught up to her. Her lawyer called it an act of desperation rather than greed, saying most of the money went toward taxes and housing arrangements. Still, it didn't change the fact that she lied on her application and swindled money away from businesses that needed it. In the end, a judge sentenced Holness to 20 months in jail and ordered her to pay back the $300,000 she stole. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section who you think has more credibility, the CDC or the Chinese government.